Now, friends, there's always something very uh, particularly exciting about starting a new session of our Lansdowne Bible School. At any rate, this is how it is for me, and I hope it is for you as well. And this evening, as you'll notice by the copy of the notes that you have in your hands, we commence the 80th session of the Lansdowne Bible School. And I want you to notice two things by way of introduction. The first is that you will, of course, have noticed that we have changed the format of the Postal Fellowship Notes and that whereas for a number of years we've had uh, coloured borders, uh, printed uh, coloured borders on our notes, we've done away with these and we've had the whole of the notes printed in one colour throughout. And I like the result very much and I believe it will be and is generally acceptable and incidentally the typeface, that is the print, is better than on our old notes and as a matter of fact I got that from a printing expert only this evening just before we came into the meeting. It's better and slightly larger and um, I like the layout very much. It's more modern and it's very attractive and uh, uh, that's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing I want to say by way of introduction is that the theme of this series of 12 studies is 12 secrets of the life that wins. And this covers a very wide range of Bible studies on the Christian life. Now, the life that wins, we might well say, is threefold. It is a holy life, a happy life, and a useful life. And if you think about that just for a moment, holy Godward and uh, happy self ward that is so far as my experience of life is concerned if it's the life that wins about which we're going to speak it's a happy life it's a holy life god ward a happy life self ward and a helpful life or a useful life man ward because it has a horizontal aspect as well as a vertical aspect it not only comes from god but it goes out through us to others. It's a useful life. Now this theme covers a great many subjects and they're all basic themes on the Christian life. And those of you who've looked at the magazine in which we have given the uh, syllabus of the 12 titles for this session will know that next week we're going to speak about and study about the abundant life, later on the disciplined life, the separated life, the guided life, right away through until we come to the last study which is entitled the glorified life because you see when a Christian dies that isn't the end we go on to glory and we enter into an even fuller and more wonderful aspect of spiritual life and eternal life than we experience down here you'll see how comprehensive the series is and how practical it is in its application to those of us who are here this evening and indeed to everybody. And I want to begin now, if you will look at your copy of the notes, I want to begin by asking you to notice very carefully what we have said in the first paragraph. You'll see that I have based our first study uh, upon some very significant words that were spoken and later on written by Dr. Charles Trumbull. And he based these words upon... Colossians chapter 3 verse 4 which you'll see at the head of the study Christ who is our life now these are very very important words really they're the basis of our study this evening the Lord Jesus Christ who is well he is a great many things to us but the thing that is mentioned here is this Christ who is our life and I want to read to you the first uh, part of the first paragraph of the notes so that we can really be quite clear what we're going to study about this evening. Christ who is our life. These five words which we have deliberately lifted out of Colossians chapter 3 verse 4 exactly explain the theme of this series of 12 studies and the particular emphasis of this first study in the series. Now this is where I got the idea for this first study from. Many years ago, Dr. Charles Trumbull said, there is only one life that wins, and that is the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
every man may have that life, every man may live that life. So you see, these words of Dr. Trumbull uh, preached, or rather spoken, just after the turn of the century, as a matter of fact, these words pinpoint the teaching that we want to underline. Not notice the title of this first study. Uh, it is this. What is a Christian? And you know very well, you don't need me to tell you this, that if you ask this question uh, of a, uh, a cross-section of people, you get a great many different answers. May I say again that in speaking of the Christian life, it is vital and absolutely essential that we know what we mean when we speak about being a Christian or when we speak about the Christian life. We, it's essential that we understand what, we, what a Christian really is and what God means and what the Bible means by the use of the word, word Christian. As a matter of fact, the word Christian is used three times in the Bible. It comes in Acts chapter 11, it comes in the testimony of the Apostle Paul, and it comes again in one of Peter's letters. So let us begin by asking the question, or rather by saying, what a Christian is not because we need to be absolutely sure about what a Christian is not so that we can dispel the false ideas that are abroad in the world before we ask and answer the question, what is a Christian? And you will notice from your notes that um, I have given some answers that people do give. And indeed, I suppose it would be true that all down the years, as I've asked various people the question, are you a Christian? or what is a Christian, or as I preached on the subject of the Christian life, these are the kind of answers that I've had, and they won't be altogether new to you, but uh, it's good for us to look at them. The first one I've suggested is this. You go up to someone and you say, are you a Christian? And he says, well, of course I am. Do you think I'm a heathen? I'm quite sure there are some people in the service tonight who've had that experience when you've uh, made reference to the fact of being a Christian. People have been quite astonished and astounded and quite put out at the very suggestion that they were not Christians. And they say, of course I am. Do you think I'm a heathen? Then I've suggested a second uh, answer. Oh, yes, I'm a Christian. You see, uh, my uh, father was uh, a Christian and my mother was a Christian and um, I had Christian parents. And, of course, I, I was born in England, you know, or perhaps they might say I was born in Wales, or in Scotland, or in Ireland. I was born in a Christian country. And that's the answer. This is the kind of definition that some people have as to what a Christian is. And then, of course, there are others, and this is number three. If you ask them, are you a Christian, they say, oh, yes, you know, I always go to church, and I say my prayers, and I read my Bible. Number four, Yes, of course, I'm a Christian. I'm not a very good one, you know. I fall very short, but I try very hard to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And then number five. Oh, yes, yes, do you know, I don't remember it, of course. I was too small, but I was christened when I was a baby. My mother told me so. And uh, later on, I was confirmed. And so on. I'm a Christian, oh, yes. And as a matter of fact, I've joined the church. Yes, I'm a Christian. Number six. Yes, I've made the teaching of Christ the rule of my life. Sermon on the Mount. Mind you, I don't always keep up to it. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Ten Commandments. Oh, yes. Number seven. Yes, I haven't always been a Christian, but I am now, you know. I'm a reformed man. I no longer swear. Well, not very often, anyhow. And uh, I don't lose my temper. Not very much, and I certainly don't drink or gamble. Oh, yes, I'm a Christian. Now, strangely enough, or significantly enough, on Sunday afternoon when I was resting and relaxing and anticipating the evening service, I switched on my radio. And there was a kind of uh, forum on uh, where uh, questions were being asked of a great company of people. Some of you may listen to this. I only listened to a little bit of it. But just enough... It was of a religious uh, flavor, you see, just enough to persuade me that most of the people who asked questions and gave answers would have said that some of these, if not all of these things, describe exactly what a Christian is. And you see, the danger here is that there is an element of truth in all these answers, but they are fundamentally wrong. 
because they do not really answer the question, what is a Christian? Now let's look at them just for a few moments and see. You see, being born in a Christian country, say being born in the Western world, where there has been Christian teaching and where there are Christian churches in abundance, being born in a Christian country, uh, instead of in the jungle or in the heart of Africa, where perhaps the Christian gospel hasn't penetrated, this doesn't make you a Christian any more than if you were born in Buckingham Palace, it would make you a member of the royal family. I remember going to a fellow in business when I was in business and asking him, and incidentally a very wonderful thing happened because very shortly after I asked him this question he was converted, he became a Christian and he went to Oak Hill College and was trained for the Christian ministry and is now uh, the vicar of a church. I don't know just where at this particular moment. But at this time, he wasn't a Christian. But I went to him because he was working in my department and a very nice fellow he was and I got friendly with him and I asked him, I said, are you a Christian? And he said, Dixon, he said, what do you mean? He said, you don't think I'm a Jew, do you? And you see, he'd got, I said, what do you mean by that? Well, he said, there are only two kinds of people out there, Jews and Gentiles. Oh no, I said, you're wrong there. But he said, tell me a third then. Well, I said, the third, according to God's word, according to the Bible, I expect I use that word, according to the Bible, there are three categories of people, Jews and Gentiles and the Church of God. And the Church of God means, of course, those who are born of the Holy Spirit, washed in the precious blood of Christ, and baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, the true Church. Not Christendom, but the Church, the Bride, the body of Christ the brotherhood of the believers. And uh, then you see, I was born in a Christian home and my parents were most wonderful Christians. I used to kneel, as some of you have heard me say, I used to kneel between my mother and father while they sort of had little family prayers and I used to say amen at the end, although perhaps my mind had been wandering. But I mean, I had all that wonderful upbringing, Sunday school. As I've sometimes said, I was born a stone's throw from the church, which we all attended. That's why we were always late on Sunday morning, because we lived so near. But you see, for 18 years, although I was so much a part of that church, I wasn't a Christian, not in the sense of which the New Testament speaks. What a heritage, is, heritage it is to be uh, in a Christian country or in a country where there is the opportunity to hear the Christian gospel or to have a Christian home. But you see, don't be misled by that. Like the fellow who was asked, are you a Christian? And he said, oh yes, my father was a parson. But you see, it doesn't follow, it doesn't run in the blood like that, does it? And because a man prays and goes to church and tries to live a good life, that doesn't, it doesn't follow that he is a Christian. Thousands of people do this. I know some very, very good people who are not Christians. That is to say, they're morally good and ethically good. They try to live good lives and they're kind and they're helpful but they're not Christians because, you see, they've got no personal relationship with Jesus Christ, as I shall show you in a few moments. Trying to follow Christ and to be like him and to be, do what he would do, that doesn't make a person a Christian. How many people think that uh, a Christian is just someone who tries in their own strength with all their effort and will and good intention and sincerity to follow the Lord Jesus? Well, of course, a Christian does do that. Not in his own strength, but a Christian does follow Christ. But that's not what a Christian is, basically. Rites and ceremonies don't make a person a Christian. In the, Christ in the Church of England, babies are christened, uh, and then they are confirmed. In our church, we dedicate little babies. And uh, the New Testament teaches baptism. And uh, we attend communion. And we join, we have a church membership. Here, and many churches do, of course, but not one of these things constitutes a person a Christian. In fact, you can do all these things, you can go through the whole lot and not be a Christian, because these are not the essential things that constitute a person a Christian. Trying to keep the commandments and to live by the teaching of Jesus does not make anyone a Christian. Some of you know the story of Pandita uh, Ramabai, the Indian uh, Christian, who before she was a Christian as a Hindu, renounced her Hinduism and she uh, embraced Christianity. It, not him, but it, the Christian system. She became a, a professing Christian. 
but she didn't know Christ. And there are many people like that, you see. They try to keep the commandments and they say, well, this, these are the teachings of Jesus. I'll try and bring my life into line. I'll try and bring my life into line with the teachings of Jesus and that'll make me a Christian. But it won't, you know. When you've been made a Christian, then you, you'll want to bring your life into line with the teaching of the Lord Jesus. But by bringing your life into line with his teaching, that doesn't make you a Christian. Reformation, giving up bad habits and adopting good ones, that doesn't make a person a Christian. I've sometimes, you, I'm sure many of you must have heard me say about the man who was, when I was in the police force during the war, as a war reserve policeman <coughs> at Doc Green. Oh, I beg your pardon, no, it wasn't at Doc Green. But when I was in the police force, um, there was a fellow who said to me one night, he knew that I was, uh, I suppose he would say, religious. And uh, he, we were out and it was a very, very dark black night. We were walking along by a canal. And uh, I don't mind telling you, I'd never been out much at that hour of the morning. And I was quite glad there were two of us. And we were walking along. And this fellow, knowing I was religious, I suppose he thought he'd give a kind of, um, you know, get onto my wavelength a bit. And he said, you know, Dixon, he said, I, I, I don't drink. Oh, I said, don't you? And he said, no. And then he said, and, uh, and I don't gamble. I said, oh, don't you? And then he said, I don't uh, this. And he said, I don't that. And he said, I don't the other. And he said, I don't swear. And he said, I don't blaspheme. And you know, he went on with all these negatives that I suddenly said to him, what on earth do you do? <laughs> and you see, reforming, which means straightening your life out and giving up the wrong things and starting to do the things, these things, this isn't what a Christian is, although a Christian will do that, but that doesn't make a person a Christian. Now, when a man becomes a Christian, he does a lot of these things. He goes to church, he prays, and if he reads his Bible, he will see the commands of the Lord Jesus Christ with regard to Christian fellowship and with regard to joining in with God's people and being one with them in, in service and in worship. He will see the Lord's command with regard to baptism and to a change of life and the teaching of Christ and so on. But doing these things does not make one a Christian. This is not what a Christian is, basically. So we need to ask, what then is a Christian? And how vital it is to answer this correct, uh, question correctly. And I've tried to do so, and I want to explain what I mean by what we've put on the note. How essential it is to get the right answer to this question. What is the right answer? Now I want you to notice three tremendously important things. It's only one thing really, but I put it into three parts to make it clear. First of all, a Christian is one who does something. Well, no, I haven't put it like that if you notice. You do do something, but basically a Christian is one who comes empty-handed and receives. You see, the, the average person thinks that a Christian is one who works and who does something in the sense of uh, giving this up or giving that up or working out salvation or trying his best to follow Christ and so on. But that's not the right answer. A Christian is one who receives. And if you study the seven uh, faulty definitions that I gave to you or have given you on the Bible school notes, you'll see that they all have to do with man's effort to get up to God. A man becomes a Christian not by his own effort to get up to God, but by turning from his sinful way, now that is to use another word, a Bible word called repentance, and by receiving what God offers to him. That's how a person becomes a Christian. Repentance is best described, I believe, in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, my way, your way, our way, and let him turn to the Lord. And when he turns to the Lord, he receives from the Lord. And this is the first thing that you must do if you're going to become a Christian. A Christian is a saved person, to use biblical terminology. And if you look up these three references I've given, Romans 3.20 and Titus 3, 5 and Ephesians 2, you'll see that our salvation does not depend upon our working or our doing. All we can do is to receive. By grace he is saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. What do you do with the gift? You have to receive it. You can't buy it. If you give a half penny 
half a new penny for it. You've bought it. And you can't buy it. It's a gift. And you can only do one thing with a gift. You can receive it or reject it. Now, a Christian is one who receives. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of the God. Uh, Romans 3.20, By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. That means to say with all the trying hard and reforming and giving this up and doing the other, going to church and saying your prayers and all these things, God doesn't accept that as the basis of salvation. These are good things. They're right things. But this isn't the way to be saved. This isn't what it means to be a Christian. A Christian is one who receives, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy. It's a gift to be received. He saves us. We therefore repeat that a man becomes a Christian by receiving. But what does he receive? All right, look at the second part of the answer to this question. A Christian is one who receives, but a Christian is one who receives a new life. Now this is the very heart of the matter. You see, the Christian life is not my old failing sinning life at all. It's a new life altogether. It's the life that is given to us when we become Christians. And the Lord Jesus made this perfectly clear in his conversation with Nicodemus, with which many of you are familiar. You remember how Nicodemus came and said, Lord, we know, Master, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. You are someone quite special. And Jesus said, do you know Nicodemus? You've got a good deal of knowledge and you're a very religious person. But except a man be born again, receive a new life, not turn over a new leaf, not be religious and go to the temple, that's good and right and proper in its place, but except a man be born again, he cannot see, let alone enter the kingdom of God. He must be born again. And when Jesus said that to that very religious and good living man, he emphasized a very, very vital truth. Namely, that when a man becomes a Christian, he becomes a Christian by receiving, and what he receives is a new life. Because he, by nature, is spiritually dead. All of us are, by nature. When we are born the first time, we receive natural life, human life. And uh, when we are born again by the operation of the Holy Spirit, when we have our second birthday, we receive spiritual life, new life. And uh, this is what makes us Christians. So a Christian is one who receives, and a Christian is one who receives a new life. There are a number of scriptures I could um, turn you to. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, where we read that God has quickened us, those of us who are Christians. We were dead in trespasses and sins, but God has quickened us. He's given us new life. We've received a new life. You remember Jesus said to one company of people, Ye will not come unto me that ye might have life. Now they had plenty of the kind of life that, that I've got, physical life, this kind of life, but they hadn't got spiritual life. But a Christian is one who receives spiritual life, new life. Let me give you another reference. Galatians 6 verse 15. In Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. You see, when we become Christians, the Lord doesn't patch up our old life. He gives us a new life altogether. And we become Christians by receiving and by receiving this new life. For if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. That's what the Bible says. And Peter also has something to say about this. He says, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word. You know, a little baby has to have a very, uh, very easy sort of diet. And God, in his wondrous uh, provision for little babies, has provided this milk, the mother's milk, for the baby. Oh, you can do this sort of artificially today as well, of course, and it's very good, I believe. But the thing is, the little baby couldn't have more than just milk to begin with. And a newborn Christian has to have milk to feed on to begin with. And the very fact that Peter says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, is emphasizing the truth that a new life has to be received. 
and it's when we receive this new life or to go back to what our Lord said to Nicodemus when we are born again that we become Christians and so let's look at our definition again a Christian what is a Christian a Christian is one who receives a Christian is one who receives a new life and the third 